So the nice thing I'll say first off is that LSAC has released nearly 100 old official LSAT administered exams in the past. So you have about 400 games you can practice on. So the way that you know how to diagram something is because you've seen many, many games previously. There's ordering, there's grouping, there's combinations of both. There's some curveballs out there, but I wouldn't worry too much about all the intricacies of all the subtypes. Just think broad strokes, ordering, grouping, combinations, and then miscellaneous. And so you look for keywords that tell you, is this an ordering game or is it a grouping game or something else altogether? The second thing I would say is, 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 is if you're at a total loss for what to do, look at the first question of the game. LSAC actually gives you what I call an orientation question, a kind of a warm up, where they actually show you how they're thinking about the scenarios and how they lay them out. So look at that and just copy it for yourself. If you're in that position, just skip it, come back to it later. On the flip side, if it's the fourth game, again, that orientation question will be a good warm up for you. And remember that even if it looks unfamiliar at first glance or looks like it's something totally new at first glance, there really is nothing new under the sun on the LSAT. They're actually kind of lazy in a way and they keep reusing old stuff, just dressing it up differently. And so if you want to avoid being in that situation where you're kind of at a loss for what to do, go back and do all the old curveball tough games from the past. I have a list of them I can share with you, run through all the weird ones that have ever appeared so you can at least get used to being presented with unfamiliar stuff. I think the biggest and most often overlooked time-saving strategy on Logic games is reusing previous work, reusing hypothetical scenarios you've drawn in the past. You have your correct answer to the orientation question, then you have any valid scenarios you've drawn previously. And so you could do your orientation question and all your if local questions first, then do your general global ones later. And a lot of times the scenarios that you've drawn will actually help you eliminate wrong answers later in the game or help you solve a question altogether. And so you can be efficient by reusing those. This is a great question. It's an age old one and there's no hard and fast rule on this. If you see a way to make multiple main diagrams, great, do it. But also know that if you're not seeing a key way to unlock the game, that's fine. Be happy with whatever diagram you've drawn up to that point. Hopefully you've made at least one little inference or two, then you can learn more over the course of the game as you draw more diagrams. Typically, the more diagrams you draw up front, the less you'll have to draw over the course of the game. So it could be more efficient, but also if you're not seeing it, you don't want to get bogged down. Just go ahead, jump into the game, jump to those local questions where they're giving you a starting point and then know that you can always make more inferences along the way. My goal for students is not necessarily that you'll solve it per all four games perfectly. That would be amazing, of course. But what we really look to do realistically under timed conditions is solve maybe two or three of the games pretty efficiently. And then you build up a time bank where you can solve the fourth, maybe toughest game a little bit more slowly. And that's just the nature of it. If you're a rock star and getting a 180, all four games super efficiently, awesome. If not, be okay with that. You can do perfectly fine drawing more diagrams over the course of a game. You know, listen, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Me too. I might initially draw something wrong, but what I do to counteract that is I reread the rules and double check before going on to the questions. That little extra, maybe 10 seconds or so, just double checking the, your diagramming of the rules could save you several minutes in the long run because otherwise, and this happens to a lot of students, they'll be halfway through the game, then realize they made a mistake because nothing's working out and then they have to go back and redo everything. So you definitely don't want to be in that position. Just take an extra second, double check that you drew everything correctly, look for your conditional indicators, for example, and then just double check knowing that before you move on. And listen, if you even can't get the orientation question right, that's probably a red flag that something went wrong. If you're getting two right answers or zero right answers, go back to your rules, make sure you did everything correctly. If not, correct course and then move on. This is a great question. It's one I get a lot. And first off, I'll just summarize and say it doesn't really matter that much, but I'll zoom out for a second and first just explain what is the stimulus? What is the question stem? The stimulus is the short bite-sized argument it might start off with an editorial or a critic, someone giving some sort of argument, typically flawed in some way. It's a paragraph that is pretty dense text. Then you have your question stem, 
which is the short single line question where LSAC is asking you to strengthen the argument or weaken the argument or do a variety of other things to the argument. Now, when I, back when I was studying, I actually read the stimulus first I was told to, and it seemed to work okay for me. But over time, I've actually transitioned to a question stem first approach because I believe it gives you the proper perspective from which to view the argument in the stimulus. But I've done it both ways. I've gotten high scores both ways, and there are plenty of top performers who do it both ways. So I think ultimately, it doesn't really matter that much. Do what works for you. If one way isn't working, switch it up and see if that changes anything. I think part of it comes down to reading actively as if you were having a conversation with someone. I like to think of it as you're having a debate with someone and you're pointing out why they're wrong. And not every question is a flaw question or a weakened question, but that way of thinking to look at the gaps in the argument and evaluate them, like someone's having a conversation with you, I think really does make it more real world relatable. The other thing I'd say is identify what's the conclusion, what's the evidence, and go from there. Look for keywords or look at the relationship between the different parts and see, can you find the conclusion? That's the first step. If then find the evidence, then look at the gap, then of course the questions then will tell you what you want to be doing, and that can lead you to start making predictions. You can definitely skip questions on the LSAT and come back to them at the end. You're not obligated to do everything in the order given. Personally, on logical reasoning, I might flag four or five questions just to come back to you later because I don't want to deal with them in the moment. Maybe it's a tough science topic question. Maybe it's a lengthy parallel reasoning question. Whatever it might be, whatever you don't like, skip it, come back to it at the end. Everything's worth the same, so there's no reason to get bogged down in something difficult. If you're coming back at the end, the nice thing about that to start off with is that you have a fresh perspective. You've gotten all the other questions under your belt, so you do have a level, certain level of security knowing that at least you finished the section and these questions are the toughest ones anyway, so at least you've, you've tackled everything else. But at this point, that fresh perspective could, maybe not for every single question, of course, but let you see the question in a new light in some way. Maybe some keyword will stand out to you that didn't previously stand out to you. And if not, hey, it's okay. You can get a few wrong and still get a top score. There's not really a one size fits all because part of it depends on your aptitude and your goals. I will say that for anyone reasonably aiming for a 165 or above, I would encourage them to try and tackle the first 10 questions in about 10 to 12 minutes. This lets you build up a time bank where if you flag four tough questions, you will have about five minutes at the end to come back to them later. And actually, speaking of the digital LSAT, I think that the biggest impact there is that you actually gain time because you used to have to bubble in with the number two pencil all those little ovals for 25 questions or 26 questions in a section. Now with one tap of the stylus or one touch of your finger, you can bubble it in instantly. So that's probably giving you another minute or two to add to your time bank for coming back later. But overall, that's my general pacing recommendation. I wouldn't go into more depth on it than that or else you'll drive yourself crazy. But I guess the other thing I would say is don't individually time single questions. Like don't time one LR question to a minute and a half or so because every question is of a different difficulty and the questions really only make sense for timing anyway in the context of the entire section. It's not easy to learn to read faster. You've been reading your whole life at this point, And so you're not going to totally reorient your entire reading ability, but there are some tricks you can use to read faster. First off, I want to say use phrasereader.com. Phrasereader.com, great tool. What it let, and I'll put the link below this video. What it lets you do is copy paste in text from anywhere and display it to yourself at different reading speeds. So you could use The Economist, you could use Scientific American, or if you have the PDFs, you could use actual LSAT questions too. Just copy them in and display them at 200 words per minute, 300 words per minute. Kind of place yourself on this reading comp treadmill to get faster. That's one thing you could do. That's kind of like a speed reading hack sort of thing. Maybe it works for you, maybe it doesn't. If not, I've got something else for you too, which is just when you're looking at the passage, dumb it down for yourself. They are so great at overcomplexifying everything, even things like I saw one reading comp passage they took from the New a New York Times article and they boringified it. Like they made it more boring for the LSAT specifically. And so if you can remove some of those layers by focusing on the basics, what are the major viewpoints and almost like caricaturing them 
for yourself, like old versus new, or subjectivism versus objectivism, or conservative versus liberal, whatever it may be. If you can just paint with a broad brush and put the different groups into a couple of major camps, it'll be much easier to relate to it, and then you'll get through it faster. I totally get where you're coming from. I honestly don't like the science ones either, but what I do is, again, I dumb it down. So let's say you have like previously people used to think about a certain topic this way. Now they think about it some other way. Like they thought the earth was flat. Now they think it's round. So you have like old versus new, the old way versus the new way. And so they could give you all the details on the theory behind each side, but you just say old way versus new. You could have wrong versus right or outdated versus updated or what the author disagrees with versus what they agree with. And there's going to be lots of details and theory and technical terminology. Skip all of that. When you see details, speed up. When you see articulations of major viewpoints, slow down and read more thoroughly. The details you can always come back to later. But my aim for my students is to get through the passage in maybe two and a half, three minutes max so that you have enough time for the questions later. If you're going pretty slow and you don't want, you can't speak, maybe you're gonna spend four minutes or five minutes reading the passage, I'd say definitely don't spend any more than four or else you'll have like 30 seconds per question or something, which isn't really enough. So you, what you might wanna do is take the approach, and this of course is limiting your score to some extent, but let's say you're not looking to break 160, you're looking to go to a middle of the road law school, which is fine if that's your goal. You might consider only doing three passages so that you have more time to go into them in more depth. If you do three passages only, then you have closer to 12 minutes per passage, which might still be, be okay then if you're spending four or five minutes on your initial read. Or if you're super slow and you think you might have ADHD, then consider applying for testing accommodations, which could give you extra time. Because then if you get time and a half or double time, then you'll have plenty of time to slow down and read more thoroughly. Great question. And I think the biggest mistake students make on reading comp is doing the questions in the order given. You do, should not do them in the order that they're given to you simply because that's how they're laid out. There are three different types of major reading comprehension questions, and I would do them in the following order. Do all the general global ones first, like what's the main idea? What's the primary purpose? What's the tone of the passage? What's the author's opinion? Do those first, they're the general, knock them out. And if you can't walk away from the passage with the main idea, then you should probably go back and get the main idea because you need that to unlock everything else for yourself. Next, you have the local detail-oriented questions. They will, at least they'll give you a key term to look for and they'll highlight it for you on the digital LSAT on the screen for you so you can immediately jump there. They might tell you give you a paragraph reference and so you could jump there or they might just ask you a random detail. Do those next. Then the, lastly, I would do the more inferential questions that require reading between the lines. What would the author be most likely to agree with? Or the questions that are more similar to parallel reasoning like analogies or strengthen or weaken. But do them in that order, which is really, again, easy to hard, and you can build your understanding as you go. For the harder questions, you may have to go back for it. There's no way around it. Those are the details that I actually recommend skimming earlier so that at least you can get to the, get the main idea, extract that, and knock out the general questions. You know, the inferential questions that require reading between the lines, those are the hardest and they're only worth tackling after everything else. And they might require a level of detail where going back would be valuable and that's okay. It's okay to go back to the passage. That's why they, they let you keep looking at it while you're doing every single question if you want to. But I'd say that ultimately these parallel questions, save them for last. They are gonna require more time and since everything's worth the same, there is no reason to spend an inordinate amount of time on them. Great question. On the digital LSAT, LSAC has given you some tools for highlighting and underlining. So these annotation tools, definitely play around with them. They're on familiar.lsac.org. You can test them out and see how they work for you. Personally, I don't really recommend using them just because it takes a lot of time to play around with them. And you might not always be marking things that are super useful for you later, but what you could do is articulate for yourself the main idea or the major viewpoint or two, if there's two or three major viewpoints, just articulate them for yourself in a key phrase or a key sentence and write that on your scratch paper on the side so at least you can refer back to it over the course of the passage. But I really wouldn't do anything more than that. Thanks for tuning into the show. 
please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.